ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, Richard Allinger, and I uh, am so pleased to uh, have you as a guest today on my Lessons in Church History. And uh, I want to remind uh, the viewers that I'm also at the same time on uh, uh, 92.1 on the FM dial on the radio, on the FM 92.1, for those of you that might want to tune in on the radio for these particular Lessons in Church History. Um, uh, it was just brought to my attention, uh, having went down uh, yesterday to the um, a water distribution point at the old Farmer's Market in Flint to, uh, to get uh, a package of bottled water and a, a water testing kit and a filter for my sink, a refill for the filter for my sink, that they handed me this, uh, those uh, uh, employees that work at the water distribution points and have those neon yellow reflector vests on, handed me this orange and blue and green sheet here with the state uh, emblem on it, the state of Michigan. So this is a, an announcement that they want to bring to your attention that I also will share with you before I get into church history content. Uh, the reduction of state run uh, points of distribution. Uh, Flint, Flint water quality update. For over a year, Flint's water has been meeting uh, federal standards. The water is now testing at seven parts per billion, which is much lower than the federal requirement of 15 parts per billion. Flint's water is one of the most monitored and testing the same as similar cities across the state and country. Use a filter. Uh, if you remember, President Obama came here before the presidential election after the water crisis had begun and actually was seen on Channel 12 WJRT-TV uh, drinking a glass of water and telling us that it is good, tastes good, and it is uh, safe to drink if you are using a filter. It's okay to drink water in Flint if you have a filter. Now, uh, here it says use a filter. Filter use is encouraged while pipe replacement is underway. CORE, or the Community Outreach and Education Teams, are going door-to-door -door ensuring homes have properly installed and maintained filters and faucet replacements if needed. You can call uh, for CORE at area code 810-238-6700. Their representatives were here at my residence and actually checked my filter in on my kitchen sink. Again, call for course at area code 810-238-6700. Why are some of the PODs or point of distributions closing? A partnership between Governor Rick Snyder, uh, Mayor Dr. Karen Weaver of Flint, and concerned pastors of social action uh, and community leaders, such as the C.S. Mott Foundation, who made a generous $45 million donation, uh, has a gift to the city of Flint to ensure that we all get purified bottled water until all of the uh, repiping takes place, will allow for the continuation of four water sites in each area of the city for the foreseeable future. While water quality has been restored, this helps provide residents additional time to prepare uh, for the ultimate transition to filtered water. Uh, the clo closing August 11th will be, the, the now these are the point of distribution hours of operation are Monday through Saturday, noon to 6 p.m. And the ones that are closing, there's, there's two that are closing August 11th, uh, 2017. That will be the one at St. Mark's Missionary Baptist Church, 3020 DuPont Street, uh, City Ward 2. And that would be across the street from Geneva Spears House, where she will be having soon a 96-year-old birthday party for her mother this month. Uh, and... Uh, we do miss the late uh, Pastor J.S. Hopkins of St. Mark's Missionary Baptist Church, but we all know that God loved him best. That one will be closing 
uh, August 11th. And then also, uh, Pastor Henry Fuller up at Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Churches Church uh, on 4805 North Saginaw Street, that's City Ward 3, will also be closed August 11th. Uh, access to functional needs, home deliveries will continue, and all other home deliveries will be discontinued. Now, closing September 5th will be the Old Farmer's Market, 420 East Boulevard Drive, down by the main post office, Flint River down there. Uh, they're putting a new dam in right now, construction in the uh, site, and traffic is quite congested down there. And they've, they've replaced First Merit Bank there on the corner to Huntington and put new signs up. That would be City Ward number 5. That one is closing September 5th. And also closing September 5th is Grace Emanuel Baptist Church, Pastor uh, Jennings, uh, 3502 Lapeer Road, Ward 7, City Ward 7, out there by the IMA Sports Arena. And uh, also closing would be Lincoln Park United Methodist Church, 3410 Fenton Road, Ward 8. Those three will be closed September 5th. Remaining open indefinitely will be uh, Pastor Kennedy's uh, Mount Carmel uh, Missionary Baptist Church, 1610 West Pearson Road, uh, City Ward 1. And uh, remaining open indefinitely will be uh, the Franklin Avenue lot 2804 north franklin avenue that would be ward number four and remaining open indefinitely will be the west court uh church of god 2920 west court street ward six by mclaren general hospital and also the east town bowling alley remaining open indefinitely uh, th uh 3001 south dort highway will be uh, Ward 9. Uh, the state of Michigan's commitment uh, to the city of Flint, the state of Michigan remains committed to supporting the city of Flint as it continues to recover and rebuild. The state provided more than $3 million to Flint in addition to the $100 million from the federal government, all of which is helping with water quality improvements, pipe replacements, health care, food resources, educational resources, and job training, and creation, and more. So we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, State of Michigan, for uh, helping us in the midst of our water crisis and finding resolution to the problems, which will probably will probably be repiped with federal and state help and your prayers and the Mott Foundation probably by 2020. Now, setting the water crisis issue aside, uh, in the last program, I didn't have time to uh, really talk about the distinctives of the Grand Old Church of God in Christ, whose headquarters is down in uh, Nashville, excuse me, uh, Memphis, Tennessee. That's where the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King spoke the evening before he was assassinated back in April of 1968. Well, th this is what the Church of God in Christ actually believes here. It says, has a classical Pentecostal holiness, the Church of God in Christ are Kojic, uh, C for church, O for of, G God, I for in, and C Christ. Kojic, Church of God in Christ. Has a classical Pentecostal holiness, Church of God in Christ, uh, or Kojic, continues to embrace its holiness heritage teaching moderation in dress, appearance, participation in secular entertainment, and prohibitions against profanity, alcohol, substance abuse, and immoral behavior. The church has a tradition of prayer, fasting, praise, and consecration uh, that was once unique to holiness or Pentecostal groups. Many mainline denominations and countless non-denominational churches that once rejected these beliefs and practices have adopted these distinctions in their worship liturgy and lifestyle practices. Uh, their, uh, uh, this is their statement on uh, marriage and sexuality. The Church of God in Christ clergy are allowed to be married. Uh, remarriage is highly discouraged, except in the case of the death of a spouse. 
Divorce is considered inconsistent with biblical teachings and highly discouraged as well. The Kojic or Church of God in Christ uh, considers any physical sexual relationship outside the sanctity of marriage to be outside of the sovereign will of God. The Kojic clergy or the Church of God in Christ clergy do not officially sanction or recognize same-sex relationships to be joined together in marriage. Kojic or Church of God in Christ continues to maintain its official position as an opponent against legalizing same-sex marriage and regards homosexuality, infidelity, and any other sexual immorality as inconsistent with Scripture. Kojic or the Church of God in Christ policies and bylaws have been established regarding sexual misconduct of Kojic or Church of God in Christ clergy. Kojic, Church of God in Christ clergy, are encouraged encouraged to have training in marriage counseling. Because Kojic uh, or Church of God in Christ uh, is uh, considered to be a Pentecostal in its distinctive of allowing the gifts of the Spirit to operate in their midst, its founder was um, Bishop Charles Mason, who was involved in the Azusa Street, the Azusa Street First Wave Pentecostal movement uh, back uh, in uh, uh, the early 1900s in Los Angeles, uh, the founder of the Church of God in Christ. And before he was in the Church of God in Christ, Bishop Charles Mason was in a, a National Baptist Convention, and he ran for uh, president of the National Baptist Convention in the late 1800s, and uh, he lost his bid uh, in the election of, amongst the delegates in the National Baptist Convention uh, to actually be elected president, so uh, they say that he liked to he liked to have guitars and drums and the clapping of hands and uh, uh, dancing and uh, down the aisles of the church uh, and being filled with the Holy Spirit to a point where you could actually uh, the believer being baptized with the Holy Ghost uh, would speak in other tongues and. Uh, uh, many of the Baptist churches do not really allow uh, a lot of that. So Bishop Mason left after losing his bid for presidency of the National Baptist Convention and uh, uh, went over toward a Baptist Costal or Pentecostal kind of uh, movement that was going on in the early 1900s that called the Azusa Street Revival. And that's why in, in Pentecostal, Pentecostal history, we have to talk about that uh, because it's linked to uh, the establishment of Bishop Mason's uh, uh, Church of God in Christ. By the end of 1906, most leaders from Azusa Street had spun off uh, to form other congregations such as the 51st Street Apostolic Faith Mission, the Spanish AFM, and the Italian Pentecostal Mission. These missions were largely composed of immigrant or ethnic groups. The Southeast uh, United States was a particularly prolific area of growth for the movement. Since uh, William Seymour's approach gave a useful explanation for a charismatic spiritual climate that had already been taking root in those areas. Uh, if William Seymour was part of the Azusa Street revival with Amy Simple McPherson, uh, William Seymour was a man that just had one eye, too. Uh, he was blinded in one eye, but he was in this revival, uh, and he had, he had already been taking root in this area. Other new missions were based on uh, preachers who had charisma and energy. Nearly all of these new churches were founded among immigrants and the poor. Uh, many existing Wesleyan holiness denominations adopted the Pentecostal message such as the Church of God in Cleveland, Tennessee, the Church of God in Christ, and the Pentecostal Holiness Church, and the Assembly of God Church. Uh, the formation of new denominations also occurred, motivated by doctrinal differences between Wesleyan Pentecostals and their finished work counterparts. Uh, such as the Foursquare and Assemblies of God formed in 1914 and the Pentecostal Church of God formed in 1919. Uh, an early uh, doctrinal controversy led to a split between Trinitarian and the Oneness Pentecostals, 
uh, the, the, the later founded the Pentecostal Assemblies, of uh, which uh, the Oneness Pentecostals had founded also the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World in 1916. Now, as you know, uh, I won't get into the discussion of what's the difference between the Trinitarians and the uh, Oneness or Jesus only, uh, but I will discuss these uh, distinctive uh, characteristics of what that is in future programming, but with my time restraints today, I can't really get into that. Uh, today, there are more than 500 million, that's a half a billion, Pentecostal and Charismatic believers across the globe. And it is the fastest growing form of Christianity today. The Azusa Street Revival is commonly regarded as the beginning of the modern day Pentecostal movement, which uh, manifested itself in th three waves starting uh, 100 years ago, the first wave, and then the second wave, and the third wave is right now. And I'll just uh, briefly touch on that because I haven't really got time to get into all the uh, minute details of this movement. But I'm going to have to touch on some of the important points. Uh, the, the origins of the Pentecostal movement, uh, you have to begin to be introduced to what that is. Uh, you have to look at American Pentecostal pioneers, uh, of which I just spoke of, William Seymour and Bishop Charles Mason and Amy Simple McPherson and Charles Farnham. Uh, and the 19th century holiness movement and the missionaries of the one-way ticket Pentecostals and Charismatics and the origin of Pentecostalism. The Pentecostal movement is by far the largest and most important religious movement to originate in the United States. Beginning in 1901, with only a handful of students in a Bible school in Topeka, Kansas, the number of Pentecostals increased steadily through the world during the 20th century until 1993. They had become the largest family of Protestants in the world, with over 200 million members designated as nominational Pentecostals. This group surpassed the Orthodox churches as the second largest uh, denominational family of Christians, surpassed only by the Roman Catholics. There's about a billion uh, Protestants in the world. There's about a billion Roman Catholics, which is two billion people altogether under the banner of Christendom with doctrinal differences. Uh, in addition to these classical uh, denominational Pentecostals, there were over 200 million Charismatic Pentecostals in the mainline number of both Pentecostals and Charismatics at well over 420 million persons in 1993. This explosive growth has forced the Christian world to pay increasing attention to the entire movement and to attempt to discover the root causes of this growth. Although the Pentecostal movement had its uh, beginnings in the United States, it owed much of its basic theology to earlier British perfectionistic and charismatic movements. At least three of these, the Methodist Holiness Movement, the Catholic Apostolic Movement of Edward Irving, and the British uh, Keswick Higher Life uh, Movement prepared the way for what appeared to be a spontaneous outpouring of the Holy Spirit in America, which are, is referred to as the Latter Reign. Pentecost, uh, the day of Pentecost in the Upper Room in Jerusalem was the uh, former reign, and uh, what's happening now is called the latter reign. And this will be going on in a bigger way, uh, more and more now, until Christ returns, because this is that which it was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, and Peter also at Pentecost, he spoke, this is that which was spoken uh, by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, saith thy God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and I will uh, uh, sh uh, give um, uh, I will I will give uh, dreams to your old men and visions to your young men, and I will shew wonders and signs in the heavens and earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that in the last days saith I God, 
I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Not some flesh, but A-L-L, -L, all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And uh, your old men will dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. And I will uh, show wonders in the uh, heavens above and in the earth beneath signs and wonders, blood of fire and vapor of smoke. Perhaps the most important immediate precursor to Pentecostalism was the holiness movement which issued from the heart of Methodism at the end of the 19th century. Although the Pentecostal movement had its beginning in the United States, it owed much of its basic theology to earlier British perfectionistic and charismatic movements. Uh, perhaps the most important precursor to Pentecostalism was the holiness movement, which issued from the heart of Methodism at the end of the 19th century. From John Wesley, the Pentecostals inherited the idea of a subsequent crisis experience, uh, variously called entire sanctification, perfect love, or Christian perfection, or heart purity. It was John Wesley who uh, poised such a possibility in his uh, influential biblical tract, A Plain Account of Christian Perfection in 1776. I would share that with you today, uh, but I will hold that to a, a future programming because of the time restraints on this particular program. It was from Wesley that the holiness movement developed the theology of a second blessing. It was Wesley's uh, colleague, John Fletcher, however, who first called this second blessing the baptism of the Holy Spirit an experience which brought spiritual power to uh, the recipient as well as an inner cleansing. Uh, this was explained in his major work, Checks to Antinomianism, written and, or published in 1771. Uh, that was just before the American Revolution. During the 19th century, thousands of Methodists claimed to receive this experience, although no one at that time saw any uh, connection with this spirituality and speaking in tongues or any of the other uh, charisms, which would be, for example, Paul going to some believers in his missionary journeys uh, uh, would tell the early believers in the first hundred years of the church, uh, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit where you are filled with the Holy Spirit? And also, Paul asked the question, uh, have you uh, received your baptism of fire yet? And Paul also asked the question, have you yet in your faith resisted unto blood? In the following, uh, and then, like I said, I would like to get into that in more detail, but the time restraint, uh, I can't do it. So stepping up to the 19th century holiness movement, uh, there, uh, that would uh, kind of be the first wave of Pentecostalism, of which I'll refer to in later programs. I haven't got time today. And then the origins, we'll look into Pentecostalism in the future when time permits and programming. And the American Pentecostal pioneers, which uh, it would take up the whole show uh, today just to talk about these different issues. And I, I just haven't got time. Uh, and then uh, also the global missionary movement that resulted uh, from this uh, uh, movement of Pentecostalism of the uh, 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 late uh, 19th and beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and I'll talk about these issues in the future. Uh, and also what is called Neo-Pentecostals and Charismatics, touching lightly uh, a little bit upon that. The first two wave, the first wave of Pentecostal pioneer missionaries produced what has become known as the classical Pentecostal movement, with over 11,000 Pentecostal denominations throughout the world. These continue to proliferate at, proliferate at an amazing rate as the century came to an end. Strangely enough, these newer waves also, uh, wave one and wave two and wave three up to our day of Pentecostalism, strangely enough, these newer waves also originated largely in the United States. These included the pro uh, Protestant neo Pentecostal movement, which began in 1960 in Van Nuys, California, under the ministry of Dennis Bennett, 
rector of St. Mark's Episcopal Anglican Church, and within a decade, this movement has spread to all of the 150 major Protestant families of the world, reaching a total of 55 million people by 1990. These are the three waves of Pentecostalism uh, that began in the early 1900s, uh, even up to our day. Now, in the last minute of this particular uh, segment of Richard Allinger Presents Lessons in Church History, I'll just conclude with the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement, the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement had its beginning in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1967 among students of faculty of De Quinesne University. In the 26 years since its inception, the Catholic movement has touched the lives of over 70 million Catholics in over 120 nations of the world. Added to these is the newest category, the third wave, which we're in right now, of the spirit which originated at Fuller Theological Seminary in 1981 under the classroom ministry of John Wimber. These consisted of mainline evangelicals who moved in signs and wonders, but who disdained labels such as Pentecostal or Charismatic. By 1990, uh, this group numbered some 33 million members in the world. So uh, I hope you can join me in my next section and, uh, of Richard Allinger Presents Lessons in Church History. your emergency plan today. Life's taught me a lot, and I'm ready for more. Well, you're not the typical kind of candidate that I hire, but you are exactly what I'm looking for. Your company could be missing out on the candidates it needs most. Learn how to find a great pool of untapped talent at gradsoflife.org. Growing up where I did, a lot of things could have gotten in the way of my goals, but I learned to push through. And that's what I bring to work every day. Caring for a family member can be challenging and lead to countless questions for them and for you. Find articles, tips, and tools from experts and others who have been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. We need a claim number. When I started taking care of mom, I didn't realize the challenge of playing so many roles. But above all, I'm still her daughter. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving. We're here to help. They said I have troll teeth. That my voice sounded like a possessed baby doll. That no one would ever love someone as stupid as me. That I was fat. Ugly. Disgusting. The effect of bullying is potent. We will no longer be the silent majority. Now, when you see online bullying, there's something you can do about it. We're gonna take action with the eye. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness, and so are you. You've messed up your son's haircut. Mm, Mom? Do you A, try to fix it? Like it never happened. B, work with what you got? Or C, show solidarity? Thank you, baby. As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. Here is my handle, and here is my spell. When I get all steamed up, then I shout. Tip, Tip me over and pour me, me out. Oh. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Cheers. Take time to be a dad today. Good 
afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so glad you can join me uh, in Richard. I'm your host, Richard Allinger, presents lessons in church history. And I, I just want to pick up here uh, concerning uh, uh, the uh, what the neo-Pentecostal charismatic movement was in the first wave of Pentecostal pioneer missionaries produced what has become known as the classical Pentecostal movement with over 11,000 Pentecostal denominations throughout the world. Uh, strangely enough, uh, these newer waves also originated largely in the United States. These included the Protestant Neo-Pentecostal movement, which began in 1960 in Van Nuys, California, under the ministry of Dennis Bennett, rector of the St. Mark's Episcopal Anglican Church. And within a decade, this movement has spread to all of the 150 uh, major Protestant families uh, of the world, reaching a total of 55 million people by 1990. The Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement had its beginning in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1967. Among students and faculty of the Dequinesne uh, uh, De University, and in 26 years since its inception, the, the Catholic movement has touched the lives of over 70 million Catholics and, and over 120 nations of the world. Added to these is the newest category of the third wave of the Spirit, uh, which originated at Fuller Theological Seminary in 1981 under the classroom ministry of John Wimber. These consisted of mainline evangelicals who moved in signs and wonders, but who disdained labels such as Pentecostals or Charismatics. By 1990, uh, these groups numbered some 33 million members in the world. In summary, uh, from the last segment of the program, uh, and what I'm uh, referring to right now with regard to Pentecostal church history, uh, in summary, all of these movements, both the Pentecostal and Charismatic, have come to constitute a major force in Christendom throughout the world, with explosive growth rates not seen before in modern times. By 1990, the Pentecostals and their charismatic brothers and sisters in the mainline Protestant and Catholic churches were turning their attention toward world evangelism. And only time will reveal the ultimate results of this movement, which was greatly impacted, which has greatly impacted the world during the 20th century. And I have to, uh, according to what Apostle Paul wrote in his, uh, after Paul was on his road to, Saul of Tarsus was on his road uh, to Damascus, Syria, he got knocked off his ho horse and blinded by the light that outside shines the sun. And after his uh, uh, conversion to Christ, uh, he, was not, he was not led back uh, from Damascus, once he got his sight back to the religion in Jerusalem, the temple and, and the Jews there, but and he was not directed back to the uh, uh, the government, the Roman government, uh, and its uh, leadership in uh, what is called Palestine. Excuse me, Hebrews, for calling your state of Israel Palestine. Uh, I know that offends you, but Paul was not called. Uh, to go to the Roman government and its occupation in Israel at the time, nor was he called to go to his religion in Jerusalem. But after he saw the light, he was directed to the backside of an Arabian desert in Saudi Arabia, close to where Moses was given the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai and was given the revelation as to how on his missionary journeys, churches, local churches would be planted. And, uh, evangelism has its place in the local church but that's not really what the local church really uh, is really all about the local church is about people and you you need to if you're going to be an obedient child of god in the new testament covenant you must be joined onto a local church and do not forsake yourself the assembling together of yourselves together so that you could together can work as a local body part of christ's body in your local church and the worship of God is central in the local church and other issues such as church discipline and the needs of uh, people in different localities and uh, making disciples and expositional preaching. 
uh, there's a lot of topics that I haven't got time right now to cover of the importance of the local church uh, that was revealed to Apostle Paul as to how these would be planted in his missionary journeys. Yes, and evangelism does have its place in the local church. And in addition to your uh, tithes and love offerings that you as a good steward give to your local church, you need to help support evangelism too because there's a place for that even in the local church and in life of Christians. Um, now, leaving uh, Pentecostal history, uh, I, by way of review, I wanted to go back uh, and review uh, uh, succinctly without too much verbosity. I don't want to, because of time restraints, talk too much uh, with many words about uh, indictment number 73 through uh, 83, uh, again, just uh, by way of review, uh, 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 that was published in the Macedonian Call Church Newsletter back in January of 1974 by the Reverend Dr. Bernard Gill, who uh, was a graduate of the Nazarene Theological Seminary, uh, the Olivet Nazarene Theological Seminary in uh, Kankakee, Illinois. Uh, and the 95 thesis and from se uh, the 70 number 73 to 83 were uh, number 73 was the church of God the church of the Nazarene uh, is in, is in uh, a denial of the sufficiency of the scripture again I'll repeat that uh, the number 73 of the 95 indictments or thesis against the church of the Nazarene published in 1974 says the church of the Nazarene number 73 uh, is in a denial of the sufficiency of the scriptures. Number 74, there is a, an ignorance of God in the Church of the Nazarene, in his holy uh, uh, Trinitarian persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Number 75, the, uh, uh, there is a failure to uh, address man's malady, in the church of the Nazarene and his utter depravity and need for a savior. Uh, number 76, uh, there is an ignorance of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the church of the Nazarene, the genuine gospel that was once delivered to us in the first century by Christ and his apostles. Number 77, uh, there is there is an uh, there is an unbiblical gospel invitation in the Church of the Nazarene. Now, I could talk for an hour just on that. There is an unbiblical gospel invitation in the Church of the Nazarene, but I haven't got time to get into it right now. But in the future, in other programming, I could uh, elaborate on that a little bit more. Uh, number 70 uh, Eight, there is an ignorance regarding the nature of the church in the Church of the Nazarene. Number 79, there is a lack of compassionate church discipline in the Church of the Nazarene. Remember I told you and what Apostle Paul wrote about the local church plants, uh, that there is a place for church discipline in the local church. Uh, and number, in addition to proclamation of the gospel and through expositional preaching, and making of disciples. Number 80, uh, there is a silence on separation in the church of the Nazarene. Remember what Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, thy word is truth, sanctify them by thy word, or separate them uh, from the world, the flesh, and the devil, because the world, the flesh, and the devil the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh are not of the Father. So to be saved and sanctified means to be given totally over and surrendered to the Holy uh, Spirit and uh, being sanctified into the image of Christ because of your love for our Heavenly Father. Uh, and you, uh, a, a believer can do this with the en enablement and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus died for, is to save and sanctify you and present you blameless to the Father. Um, number 81, uh, there is a replacement of the scriptures regarding the family in the church of the Nazarene. 
Now, uh, again, in future programming, I will talk a little bit more about that. But right now, I haven't got time to elaborate on this. There, number 81, there is a replacement of the scriptures regarding the family in the Church of the Nazarene. Remember last program I told you they're an LBGT uh, affirming church, so they're, they're accepting the unbiblical uh, definition of what family and marriage is now. Uh, and that's why I wanted to read that, uh, review that, go run that by you one more time. And then number 82, um, the um, pastors uh, in the uh, Church of the Nazarene are malnourished in the Word of God. Again, the pastors in the Church of the Nazarene are malnourished in the Word of God. And because it's a market-driven ministry, they are interested more in uh, money and numbers of people generating money by a market-driven ministry than they are uh, ministering the Word of God and being led by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Christ is seen uh, on the outside of organized religion, be it Protestant or Catholic, knocking, wanting to get in. Uh, and then number 83, uh, the, Roman, the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of the Nazarene uh, both were silent on the 1933 repeal of the 18th Amendment of the United States Constitution. And they both, the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of the Nazarene, are grieving the Holy Spirit by serving alcoholic wine in uh, the sacraments of the Holy Communion at the Lord's table. Now, for all the young people that might not have been living back in 1933, uh, when uh, uh, that's back in FDR's time, 1935, FDR uh, made a mandate federally for local labor unions to begin to be established, and also he established and signed into law Social Security uh, Administration. Uh, federal government uh, dispensing money to older people well also this was an issue too at that time prohibition and the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of the Nazarene leadership were totally silent about this prohibition in the United States was a uh, and I'm reading this mostly for younger people prohibition in the United States was a nationwide constitutional ban on the production importation transportation and sale of alcoholic beverages that remained in place from 1920 to 1933. During the 19th century, alcoholism, family violence, and saloon-based political corruption prompted activists led by a uh, 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 holy Protestants uh, to end the alcoholic beverage trade uh, to cure the ill uh, society and weaken the political opposition. Um, one result was that many communities in the late 19th and 20th centuries introduced alcohol prohibition with the subsequent enforcement in law becoming a hotly debated issue. Uh, public uh, prohibition supporters called Dries presented it as a victory for the public morals and health. The holy people in the churches disdain the production and sale of alcoholic beverages because the Bible says that you are to uh, uh, remain sober and uh, stay away from strong drink. Uh, Jesus is our led the way to Calvary. Uh, he's our Savior and Master and Redeemer, and he's our example we follow, and he was never out of control of the Holy Spirit. And the water that he turned into wine at the wedding feast of Cana, the first miracle in his public ministry, it was non-fermented fruit of the vine. It wasn't alcoholic. Uh, the devil will try to move on people to get them to justify uh, getting into harmful behavior, which grieves the Holy Spirit and hurts them ultimately. And many of them has taken their lives. Alcoholism has ruined many lives. Uh, and so, young people, the history of uh, this prohibition amendment, the United States Senate uh, proposed the 18th Amendment on December 18, 1917. On November 18, 1918, prior to the ratification of the 18th Amendment, the United States Congress 
passed a temporary wartime prohibition act which banned the sale of alcoholic beverages having an alcohol content of greater than 1.28 percent this act which had been intended to save grain for the war effort was passed after the armistice ending world war one was signed on november 11th 1918 upon being approved by a 36th state of january uh, 16th, 1919, the amendment was ratified as part of the Constitution. The Wartime Prohibition Act took effect June 30th, 1919, with July 1st, 1919, becoming known as the, 30, uh, the, thir the Thirsty First. On uh, October 28th, 1919, Congress, Congress passed a Volstead Act, the popular name for the National Prohibition Act, over President Woodrow Wilson's veto. The act established the legal definition of intoxicating liquors as well as penalties for producing them. Although the Volstead prohibit, prohibited, although the Volstead Act prohibited the sale of alcohol, the federal government lacked resources to enforce it. By the terms of the by the terms of the amendment, the country went dry one year later on January 17, 1920. By 1925, in New York City alone, there were anywhere from 30,000 to 100,000 uh, speakeasy clubs. While prohibition was successful in reducing the amount of liquor consumed, it stimulated the proliferation of rampant underground organized and widespread criminal activity. Many were astonished and disenchanted with the rise of uh, spectacular gangland crimes such as Chicago's St. Valentine's Massacre in 1929 when prohibition was supposed to reduce crime prohibition lost its advocates one by one uh, while it went while the wet opposition talked of personal liberty new tax revenues from legal beer and liquor and the scourge of organized crime and the, the rise of the mafia, if you remember the Al Capone days. Uh, on March 22, 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt signed into law the Cullen Harrison Act, legalizing beer and alcohol content to 3.2% by weight and wine of a similarly low alcohol content. On December 5, 1933, ratification of the 21st Amendment repealed the 18th Amendment. However, the United States federal law still prohibits the manufacture of distilled spirits without meeting numerous licensing requirements that make it uh, impractical to produce spirits for personal beverage use. Like, for instance, if you want a liquor license to operate a nightclub that serves liquor, you might have to pay $25,000, which uh, is kind of a... Uh, hindrance to people wanting to have to keep pay that amount of money to be able to uh, sell people uh, the poison the to that's toxic to their uh, biological systems that's why the Lord forbids it in the Bible uh, and again I'll read that to you uh, number 83 the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of the Nazarene were both silent on the uh, 1933 repeal of the 18th Amendment of the United States Constitution and grieves the Holy Spirit by serving alcoholic wine in, in the ministry of the sacraments of the Holy Communion at the Lord's table. And then uh, going, uh, trying to reach the end of the 95 indictments against the Church of the Nazarene uh, in the time restraints of today, uh, number 90 reads, uh, <clears throat> the Church of the Nazarene's Board of General Superintendents will have to realize the pursuit of self's perceived needs is at the core of man's flight from God. Ever since the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, which I think was a pomegranate, it's a very seedy fruit with a star of David on its stem, shaped leaf, they've been running from God. Uh, the Church of the Nazarene's Board of General Superintendents will have to realize the pursuit of self-perceived needs is at the core of man's flight from God, and it is poor handling of Scripture to cast God in the role of a cosmic need meter. 
The driving force of redemption is not meeting needs. It is to magnify God's grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. Remember what Paul wrote, uh, how the church would be planted all for the glory of God. Doxological purpose is not really meeting the needs of people. It, it was a divine to, me, to please God, not to please humans. Uh, that's the doxological, for the glory of God, not for the glory of man. Uh, the driving force of redemption is not meeting needs. It's, it is to magnify God's grace, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. That's why it's important for you to uh, assemble yourselves together and be joined unto a local church. If you are a Christian, uh, you're exhorted so in the Bible. God's first love is rooted in the value of his holy name. Y-H-Y, Y-H-Y-H, not the value. Again, this is Hebrew for Y-H-Y-H, -H, Yah, or Yahweh, his holy name, the one who spoke to Moses from the uh, Mount Sinai sites in the burning bush, his holy name. Uh, the driving force of redemption is not meeting needs, uh, it is to magnify doxologically, in a doxological manner, God's grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. God's first love is rooted in the value of his name. Remember, there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. His holy name, Yah. Yahweh. So love the world that he gave his only begotten son, Yeshua, Jesus, that every... Uh, tongue should confess and every knee should bow that he is Lord, not the value. Number 91. The Church of the Nazarene having a loss of the awareness of El Elyon, or the Most High God, has objective and transcendent resulted in her adherence to the central philosophical tene, making the church and or gospel attractive to the lost, euphemis euphem mystically labeled seekers or unchurched combined with the highly pragmatic utilitarian approach to ministry has yielded tragic results dr wt perkiser warned of uh, this years ago uh in his book conflicting concepts of holiness he was the editor of the herald of holiness in the nazarene uh protestant denomination written before his death in 1992. Uh, if you can, go to Amazon and put in uh, uh, under book slot search w, Dr. W.T. Perkiser, Conflicting Conflicts of Holiness, uh, uh, that he wrote before his death in 1992. Uh, it would be a good read for you, and it would only cost a couple dollars on Amazon. Number 92. America and the global community being greatly challenged is facing an organized, demonically-led international terrorist plot which seeks to destabilize the worldwide morally bankrupt culture, uh, which beggars description, that is similar to the conditions of Noah's day before the flood, has pressured the Church of the Nazarene to adopt its ethical worldview and to believe that right and wrong are determined by what is socially, legally, and culturally acceptable, especially with regard to moral issues, and is most clearly evident when it comes to abortion on demand. This ethical relativism that has crept into the Church of the Nazarene is unbiblical. The Church of the Nazarene does not have a biblical world view. The greatest need of the Church of the Nazarene due to the present spiritual decline is revival, revival, revival. Well, with the time restraint of today's program, uh, I'm not going to be able to finish. I was hoping to be able to finish all 95 of the indictments against the Church of the Nazarene that was published in 1974, but I'll have to pick that up in another program. So this is Richard Allender saying to all of you in TV land, goodbye, friends, and I hope that you'll join me again in my program, Richard Allender Presents Lessons in Church History.
I understand. I know it's not your typical resume. Okay, well. But Candidate. But I've been working double shifts just to pay for books. I've been raising my two little brothers. I'm determined, driven, motivated. Isn't that what you're looking for? Look beyond the resume and discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Llama al 1 971 2013 y obtén información para cuidar mejor a quien cuidó de ti. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for information on how to provide even better care for the person who wants to care of you. Yes, but I see you don't have a college degree. Well, no, but Okay, I can... well. Wait, wait. Before you skip over me, can you at least hear me out? No, I do not have a college degree, but I've been working two jobs since the age of 18. I've been doing internships while raising my little brother, and any moment that I can spare, I'm studying, just, just trying to better myself. Okay, I'm ready for this. Wow. I'd love to hear more. Look beyond the resume and discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Growing up where I did, a lot of things could have gotten in the way of my goals, but I learned to push through, and that's what I bring to work every day. Caring for a family member can be challenging and lead to countless questions for them and for you. Find articles, tips, and tools from experts and others who have been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. I understand. I know it's not your typical resume. Okay, well. But candidate. But I've been working double shifts just to pay for books. I've been raising my two little brothers. I'm determined, driven, motivated. Isn't that what you're looking for? Look beyond the resume and discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org.